Okay, so my name is Kristin Vala Ragnarsdóttir. My um, friends call me Vala. And I'm a colleague of, of Ragnarsdóttir in her aquaponic projects. I'm originally a, a geologist, but in the year 2000, I woke up to the issues of the unsustainability in the world. And since I have been trying to address these issues and see how I um, and the people around me and the international uh, community I work with uh, and my students can be a part of the solution for the future. So today I'm going to ask you um, two big questions. And number one is, can aquaponics help achieve the EU's circular economy goals? The EU now is aiming for a circular economy. There's a big consultation going on now in, in Europe. And uh, as you probably are aware of, there was an unprecedented uh, process that uh, rolled off the ground in 2012 to develop the next development goals for the United Nations, which are referred to as the Sustainable Development Goals. And they are very likely now to be agreed on the 25th of September in New York. And these goals are not only for developing countries. There are 17 goals that will be agreed, as it looks like now, with 169 targets. Uh, so they're very complex. And it's not only the developing countries that are supposed to report on these sustainable development goals, but all countries, which is 193 countries around the world, will need to report to the United Nations on how they are achieving these goals. So there is a huge process uh, going on right now in consultations on what are the indicators, how are we going to do it, who has the knowledge, who can help, and so on. So this is actually a, a big uh, job opportunity uh, for young people that have an understanding of the process. So we could say that since the year 1900, when we had 1.5 billion people on the earth, uh, and today when we have 7.3 billion people, the earth has been shrinking from a population perspective. Because in the year 1900, we had almost eight global hectares to support our food and consumption and waste. Um, and now we have less than two. And if the population continues to rise to nine or 10 billion, it will be less than one and a half. So the earth um, is being overexploited. And um, in, in terms of ecological footprint, we are now using 1.6 Earths. So that is, we are using too much of the capacity of the Earth to regenerate itself. And this is why we are having the immense um, degradations on ecosystems ac across the globe. Um, this has also been expressed in what's called um, planetary boundaries. A uh, very important paper that came out in 2009 in Nature by 29 scientists from around the world who defined nine point boundaries for the Earth. And we have already surpassed three of these. That is climate change. We now have too much CO2 in the atmosphere. For a stable atmosphere, we shouldn't have more than 350 ppm CO2 in the atmosphere. Now we have 400 and rising. Uh, it's the cycling of nitrogen. We capture nitrogen from the atmosphere and then uh, put it on our land as fertilizer and it escapes into our rivers and oceans, causing huge areas of dead zones because of algal blooms. And then we have biodiversity loss. We are now in the period of mass extinction. So it doesn't look too good. We definitely need a new direction. And if you, it doesn't matter what you look at, whether it's population or GDP, gross domestic, domestic product, dams, urban population, number of telephones, McDonald's, it, all the curves look the same. What sort of a curve is this? Huh? Exponential curve, yes. 
So we've had exponential growth in all of this uh, in the time period from 1750 to 2000. And those of us that understand that there are limits in the world because we only have one Earth and we only have a limited amount of each of the resources we have knows that if you have an exponential curve you will reach a maximum and then you need to go down on the other side. So we are about to hit that limit. And there was an economist, British economist in the US who, uh, called Kenneth Bolting who stated in the 50s anyone who believes that unlimited growth is possible in a limited world is either a madman or an economist. So there's a big problem with the economic system that we have been following, which is generally referred to as uh, the neoclassical economics. Uh, economists seem to feel that we have an unlimited world and technology will always find a way to save us. Uh, we, are, we are starting to see now that this is not the case. And it was actually predicted in the limits to growth study by Dennis and Donella Meadows and, and co-workers in 1972. And he, Kenneth Boulding's um, colleague in mathematics, probably in the next building, he has stated, and you can find many YouTube clips where he is expl explaining to people what exponential growth means. He says the greatest imperfection of mankind is that it does not understand the consequences of exponential growth. So people do not understand that the higher the percentage of growth, the faster we have a doubling time. So if, if the, um, we, take, we take the number 70, which is the nat natural logarithm of 2, and if we want to find a doubling time, we divide by the percentage. So if the rise is 7%, that means the doubling time is um, 10 years, or so 7 into 70. If the, if the, if the um, uh, growth rate is, is 3%, uh, it would be about uh, 5 years. So, no, I'm sorry, 14 years. So, uh, and in, in the Icelandic banks, um, as probably some of you know, we we had these banks which were opened up um, across Europe. But only two had been uh, opened up, but more were on the horizon that offered return on your um, investment or money uh, over 18%. So that means if you put your money into the bank, then it will double in, in about four years. And this, of course, is unsustainable. And also, in each doubling time, you are uh, taking, oh, oh, you're taking more, if you're looking at a resource use, for example, than in all the other doubling times before. So I started uh, looking into, you know, how can we actually build a sustainable world? And I was very happy to discover this framework by my colleague, Alan Atkinson, which puts sustainability into a compass where we consider nature, that's north, uh, the economy, uh, which is east, uh, society, which is south, and W, which is well-being, that's west. And in order to have a sustainable system, whether it's a societal system or, or any uh, local system, whatever you're looking at, all of these directions interact and they need to balance so that the use of uh, uh, nature uh, in our economy builds just societies which underpins the well-being of people. And what I'm going to talk about today, I decided to present that in this, uh, in this uh, compass I've sort of put then the sort of the major issues I've been ad addressing in the last 15 years. And what's read is something that I will talk about in some, some uh, aspects. And so I'll talk a little bit about permaculture. The world we live in, uh, we can look at it as an ecosystem. 
So basically for people to be able to live, we need energy and phosphorus to make fertilizer, to make food and, and people. So you could say energy pulls phosphorus and food, uh, put soil here also, makes people. Okay? Then we need materials um, for our infrastructure and uh, we transform uh, these materials uh, through work and by doing that we can create wealth. And on, so on top of the energy of the resources and the people, we can have civilization. So the first tier in the ecosystem, our primary production is here. The second one is here where we have work and wealth. And then the civilization is the third tier. And in for order in, so in order for civilization to thrive, we need energy and resources. And with my colleague and husband, Harald Sverdrup, I just published a paper, a over 200 page paper on natural resources in a planetary perspective. And this is something we started uh, looking at together in a European project that Alice Marie was involved with uh, called Converge. Uh, so if you're interested in finding more about out more about resources and how long they will last, because I can only give you a brief overview, you can download this from the internet, from the web page of Geochemical Perspectives. Now, can we have an exponential growth together uh, uh, forever? You know, Kenneth Bolting said no. So we started looking at resources. How fast have we been using them? And here we have about 14 different resources um, plotted on here, the annual global production as a function of time from 1900 to 2010. And you can see that these lines form roughly straight lines on this plot, which is logarithmic. And remember your maths, if you take the logarithm of an exponential curve, you get a straight line. Okay, so the to, to the rise in the res, uh, use of these resources is somewhere between uh, three and, and seven percent. So every year we are extracting more. We are making deeper holes in the in the ground. You know, this is a this is a diamond mine in Russia, which is a one and a half kilometer deep. So this is what we are doing to our earth to try to get our resources. And I'm sure you've heard about the concept peak oil. We have now passed the produ peak production of oil. That means we still have half of it left, but this is the oil which is difficult to get out of the ground. It's deeper, it's uh, under Arctic ice. It's in the North Atlantic. It's uh, in, uh, you know, five kilometers under the ground and, and, and so on. So we still have oil, but it's going to become very expensive. Um, and so the age of cheap flights and so on is almost over. And yet uh, across the globe, they are building more terminals and more airports. I don't think that's a very good investment because there's no plan B for fuel for airplanes. And let, it, it, we could be smart and say, okay, we're only going to, going to use oil for airplanes and all other energy production is not going to be oil. But we haven't reached, come there yet. We are, we are now at the time of coal, PMP coal production also. So again, there is uh, uh, half left, but, but this is the dirty and the difficult coal to get. And this means you will have a global energy peak in about five years time. And because the renewable energy, which you see here, so this is uh, oil, gas, and coal. This is nuclear because uranium is also limited. This is hydro, we can produce a little bit more hydro. And this green is the renewable energy, the wind and the solar and so on, which we can produce because that is also material limited. We can never produce as much energy, renewable energy, as we produce with our cheap coal and oil. And this is depicted here by uh, Colin Campbell. It's very typical for oil 
oil uh, executives, they don't speak out very much when they are working for oil companies, but when they retire, they come out at, and start speaking. And it's true for, for other executives, not only in the oil industry. So he depicts here peak oil with, a, with Guinness in Ireland. He lives in Ireland. So in 1900, we had a full glass. Now in 2000, we had half a glass left. And in 2100, we'll have no oil left. So we have used up the oil in, a, in an incredibly fast time. So oil is created by, a, you know, biogeochemical forces um, over millions of years, and we are, we, are, we are burning it all up in 100 years. Now, how smart is that? And if we look at many other resources, we have looked at over 40 resources, then they also follow these peak curves, because we also have a limited amount of them, because metal resources and phosphorus resources, they are also formed through geochemical processes which take millions of years. So we have already gone past peak gold production, silver will be in 2030, indium in 2050, and so on. Phosphate we have passed, and that is for fertilizer, so that has an implication for food production. And for tillable soils, we passed uh, the, the peak of, of those in the year 2000. And this has a huge implication, the phosphate peak and the soil peak for food production. And this is why your interest in aquaponics is crucial for uh, food security in the future. Um, I know you are all interested in these issues, but I'm not quite sure that you realized why this was such a crucial issue. Did you? Did you realize that we were hitting a time of, of, of perhaps food scarcity? Yeah, some of you, not all of you. Were you just interested because it was sort of a neat, neat thing to do? No? Both. Did you realize, yeah, both? <laughs> okay. Um, and, and so we have looked at how long these uh, resources will, will last if we continue to use them as today. Everything as red, we will use up entirely uh, within the next 100 years. What is orange is within the next 200 years and so on. So we, we reach over here uh, thousands of years when we reach the dark green. And, and so just as a scenario um, implication, then here we start to recycle 50% of all the resources, so we get more uh, orange and, and green in here and yellow. Uh, here we recycle 90%, here we recycle 95%, and here we reduce the population by half. And here we reduce the population by half and our consumption by half. Uh, it's not that we are going into uh, population culling, but it's just to show that population is very important, and population is usually an issue that uh, politicians are unwilling to discuss. In, in using up all these resources, it would be nice to think that we had created a world which is equal and where we feel good. Now, the only thing that politicians seem to look at is GDP, gross domestic product, that's the flow of, of, of money through the system. So it doesn't matter whether we have a bad year of, of environmental disasters, then GDP goes up. Or a big um, um, societal uh, uh, problems, GDP goes up. So it's actually a bad measure of how good nations are doing. And the creator of it uh, warned against this. I've just read a book about the GDP and how it became so important. And he said it should not be used to measure uh, the, the, how well nations are doing. It, he in, uh, invented it in the, in the 1930s after the big economic collapse to get, the, to get the economy of the US going again. But if we have a look at what's called the genu genuine progress indicator, then you take into account other issues just than just money flow. You, you subtract from it the environmental degradation, you add on to it the positive things we do in society, like voluntary work and 
and uh, work of mothers at home and so on, or fathers for that matter. Uh, and that's, that's, that is the GPI. And there are about 20 different issues that are subtracted or added. And then you can see that since the uh, 1970 approximately, the GPI has been sort of the same, if not going down. But GDP is going up. And therefore, we need some new indicators of progress. I'll talk about that a bit in, in, uh, later. And in, in this time, in the last, um, in, in extracting all these resources, we have generated an incredibly unjust world. Uh, this shows the um, average income in, in uh, uh, 140 countries, I think. And you can see that there is a big difference between Luxembourg at the top and Congo at the bottom, about a, a ratio of uh, 180 against one. We also have, uh, people have not been getting happier. So this is, comes from the United States. You can see people have been asked about their happiness since the 50s, and they're not getting happier. If anything, they're getting less happy. Huh? But the income is going up. So money doesn't make us rich. Also, the more inequality we have, like in the United States, the more societal problems we have, the more people in prisons, the more uh, people with health problems, and so on. Whereas in the equal countries, like Japan and Sweden and the Scandinavian countries, uh, which are much more equal, there are fewer of these problems. And then, uh, so we, we look at GDP, so this is the global GDP in 19, 2011, $63 trillion. But on top of that, we have all this gambling going on. We have $87 trillion on shares and bonds. We have $600 trillion in, in uh, uh, financial futures and derivatives, that is, when, when the financial institutions are selling future resources, future grains, future oil, future energy, future gold, it turns out that they have already sold 10 times more gold than there is on the planet. So some people have, think they have an investment in gold, but it's paper gold. It's, it's, it's a line and a spreadsheet in the bank. And then we have all this currency trading. Now that was one of the factors that affected the collapse of the krona, because they were actually gambling on the collapse of the krona. So this is all legal. You know, in my opinion, all of this stuff has to stop. We have to stop this. And, and you know, I, I picked up a financial newspaper in London this week, and, and, and every indicator in, in that an article was about a shaky, shaky uh, parts of the economy. So um, I think that there is a big uh, collapse coming again, but I don't know when it will be. Uh, and this is why building resilience, like being able to produce our own food, is so important. Because at the same time, we can also build community, like um, the lady was talking about here, Wendy, earlier on. So we've been thinking in a very linear fashion. We dig up a resource like phosphorus sometimes, somewhere we make, we make um, a fertilizer and we, we, we put it on our ground and we produce food and then the waste goes into the river, causing huge environmental degradation uh, because of eutrophication in water, surface waters. But what, and in, in, the, in the material usage, we used to take 100% uh, make something out of it, put it into the market, and then dig it down into a landfill somewhere. So uh, we needed 100% here and 100% here ended up in the landfill. But now we need to build this circular uh, system uh, by being very effective in recycling. I think recycling is going to be the most important industry um, this, um, this century, and, do, and learning to do that well. And we could do that by, learn, um, by studying nature, because in nature, in a sustainable ecosystem, a forest, for example, if we leave it alone, it, it can go on forever, because we are recycling the nutrients. Uh, and so n industries are now starting to think of how, how they can do that. So the waste from one industry 
is a resource for another. So, with Harald, uh, and, and which is actually outlined in this paper I talked about earlier, we're building uh, what we call the, call the world model. Harald is a systems dynamic uh, analyst and has been building um, system dynamic models for 30 years. Um, and this model has many similarities with the model built by Dennis and Dalala Meadows um, in, in Limits to Growth. Uh, except there they put all the resources and energy together and looked at the effect of population on extraction of resources. But f in our model all the resources are separate and we can do this because the computation capability now is much better. Um, the Meadows built a, a computer model which ran on the biggest computer in the United States at MIT. It took three, years for each, uh, three weeks for each run. But this model, which is much more complex, runs um, in seconds on our laptop. So uh, this model is now being uh, supported by the German government, which wants to build a circular economy for uh, Germany. Now, and we have ground truth this model back to the Roman times. Harald is very interested in history. And, and here we have the uh, amount of silver in, in Roman coins from, from uh, 500 years before Christ and until here, 400 be, uh, 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 after Christ. And you can see that the uh, indicators of the economy of the Romans, like marine shipwrecks and uh, archaeological art artifacts and so on, which are in the model, they uh, sort of uh, embed the... Uh, the silver content in, in the um, monetary system of the Romans. So we can uh, predict the collapse of the Roman Empire as well as other empires. And, and so uh, the Roman Empire was built on silver forests and soil and once they dig, uh, were unable to dig out, you know, conquer more land and get more resources and they had cut down their forests and degraded their soil they and, and had no more silver, then, then they collapsed. So this, is, this brings us now to the circular economy. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it because I think it's important for what you are doing. Um, so I sit on a panel of, of people who are advising the EU on the circular economy. Um, and uh, so I have many arguments with the economists, of course. Um, but if you look back, then it was Kenneth Boulding, who, who I, I quoted before. He wrote in the 1966 that we needed to go away from the cowboy economy, which is endless frontiers of resources and the ability to move on on abandoned problems. This is what we have been doing. And we needed to go to the spaceship economy. He was looking at an economy, so looking at the Earth like a spaceship, that is, if you're on a spaceship, if you, if you do not ma manage to circulate uh, the nutrients and circulate the air, then you will die on the spaceship. And basically he was saying that we need to do the same thing on the Earth. Um, so recycling started to be a buzzword in the 1990s that I remember uh, when I lived in the, in the US in the 1980s at the end of that period uh, the, in, in my backyard in Chicago, I had three or four bins where I was supposed to sort my, my, my uh, rubbish. And before that, there had been a recycling center for me to go. Then I moved to Britain in 1989, nothing was re recycled. And, and, and it, it wasn't until the, after the year 2000 that we started getting recycling bins. Isn't that right, um, Alice? Okay. Um, Japan was very uh, early in introducing a range of measures, measures for recycling. Um, and now so South Korea, Switzerland and Germany have exceeded um, the Japanese and are, are now the most effective. Uh, have you grown up with recycling? Do you sort out all your rubbish? Everybody? You go to the recycling center? 
with all your plastics and your metals and papers and things like that. You see, I didn't see any recycling until in the US in the 1989, and then I was 35 years old. So, so um, you, you are, uh, I'm sure, much better at this um, than, than I am. Now, the um, European uh, Union has encouraged recycling of uh, electronic waste, but major categories are, are down to the different countries to sort out. So municipal waste, for example, ranges to be uh, recycled 46% uh, to, to 3%. So there's still a long way to go in, in, in Europe, particularly in the former um, communist countries, the poorer ones. Now, after the economic grow, uh, collapse in 2008, uh, the OECD wrote a paper about the green economy, that we needed to put uh, all our efforts into building green technologies, re, you know, look at recycling and green energy and so on. And the uh, European Commission followed in 2011, uh, wrote a, a, a document on the resource efficient Europe uh, and this is a part of the Horizon 2020 strategy, which is the current research cycle uh, in the European Commission. And in two, the same year, they produced a roadmap to a resource-efficient Europe. And the country that is following this uh, through most effectively is Germany. So Germany is actually a leader in this issue. Um, and they said that they need to do this for environmental protection, um, selling products to consumers for employment uh, and resource security. So resource security is now an issue. People are starting to worry about, oh my God, all the rare earth elements which are important for smartphones and computers and so on. Uh, they are now in China and the Chinese are not exporting any of it except in these phones. So then we need to take the phones and recycle them, recycle them at home if we want to have some primary metals. So we need to be smart about this. And then there was a high level group uh, formulated the, in the European Union called the European Resource Efficiency Platform. And they wrote a, a um, manifesto 2013 um, uh, on resource-efficient Europe with policy recommend recommendations. Um, so th the idea is that we go from the cradle-to-grave grave ideology, that is, which I was talking about, the linear thinking, to and what the Commission calls take, make, consume, dispose, to the cradle-to-cradle idea where we put everything in a, in a circle. And this way we can maximize the value uh, from natural resources. Um, we can be restorative or regenerative by design and it, this eliminates waste. Um, and end of life projects are sources for materials of future use. So um, this is what Europe is aiming for. In 2014, at the end of the last commission, Barrasso, who had a big scientific um, advisory board behind him, um, he uh, put forward the detailed proposals on the circular economy. But the new uh, commission said, no, 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 no. We need to th have a rethink. So now there's a consultation going on because Juncker wants the focus to be on jobs and growth. But at the same time, we can do some circular economy. So um, I think um, I think that the, uh, at the end of this consultation, they will go back to the idea, but um, the new commissioner wants it to be his, his baby. Now, there are various uh, organizations within Europe, in, including the Ellen Mar MacArthur Foundation in Britain, uh, the European Environment Bureau in Brussels and so on, have written many documents about the circular economy. Uh, also, the uh, Environment Ministry of, of Germany. 
uh, and they come up with all sorts of facts and figures about you know what what this circular economy will do for us. Um, and the, one of the problems that they they have pointed out is that we are locked in the old model, uh, and that companies uh, lack information, um, and that they need um, education uh, to change so that. Uh, the issues related to the circular economy are in our education programs in design and engineering and economics and business schools and so on. Um, and then also, if we are going to use the materials better, then we need to go away from the throwaway economy where a computer like this is, is uh, redundant in three years, okay? And because you can't go in and change the bits inside the computer. So what you have to do is to, you know, take this to recycling and buy a new computer. But in, when, we, when we start being good at, at the circular economy, we need to be able to um, uh, um, fix things. And, and vocational training is needed so that we have people actually who can fix things for us. So we will get uh, more people into uh, being repairers and fewer people into selling new stuff. So that's why we need the different education. Um, and there are, there are already products being uh, designed for recycling. Um, has anybody heard about the Fairphone in Holland? So the Fairphone in Holland is actually a smartphone, but it's designed for you, you say what the phone should be able to do, and then they put it together, and then if you want an upgrade, they open it up and put in a new chip, and it's the same size and shape, and, and upgrade it. So uh, this is where we need to go, but in order to that, we need the knowledge of how to do it. Yeah, so I already said that. There is now a, there is a consultation going on, and I was just wondering whether the cost aquaponics uh, group should send in comments on the circular economy with focus on recycling of, of nutrients. Uh, why not? Then there will be more research on aquaponics in the future, in future calls. I might not, uh, it will not hurt the course, definitely. Okay. Now, I really like this. There's a, there's, there's a, a uh, a singer from the United States and an environmental activist who has, pa who has passed away. But he said, if it can't be reduced, reused, repaired, rebuilt, refurbished, refinished, resold, recycled, or composted, then it should be restricted, redesigned, or removed from the market. So this, this is where we need to go. So good guidelines. Okay, and there are many hopeful signs. Um, there are, so the EU is focused on the circular economy. There's a huge degrowth movement in Europe, especially in the French and Spanish speaking uh, world of, of Europe. Um, China, which is suffocating itself, um, only 50% of the population has access to clean water and they do not see a blue sky. The population wants clean water and blue sky. So, China now has a new constitution where the building of an ecological civilization is at the forefront and they have a five-year plan. China went through the Industrial Revolution in 30 years, something we did in 300, and I think if China takes this on, there will be a change. I hope they will. Okay, and there are all sorts of things happening. Parallel currencies, ethical banks, regenerative bank in Florida, that's a new one. John Fullerton is working on. There is the sharing, the solidarity, the service, the gifts, the time economies, and many more. Uh, there are social enterprises, like the ones that Alice is working on. There is the peer-to-peer -peer society. I was at a meeting in, in South Africa on governance in June, where the founder of the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation spoke, and, and he was describing this new society that young people are building underneath the radar of governments, where everything is open source, and, and uh, people work together, 
um, and they uh, share their knowledge. Uh, they share how you know how to how to build things and make things and you know 3D printing and all this. So he he described this completely new uh, uh, society which is emerging, which peop um, the, the, our politicians do not seem to be aware of. And then we have transition towns and eco villages and permaculture and and, and so on. So this, and which is which is, which is rising. So um, the grassroots are doing their bits. Now, I think aquaponics is important for the circular economy because it uh, encourages the conservation of, of natural resources like water and nutrients and energy um, and, and brings the food closer to the market and lowers uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and therefore is, is incredibly important for food security. And people are developing alternative uh, 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 lifestyles. I, can, I have seen it in my students in the past 15 years that they want a different world from the world they live in. They want access to land, they want to grow their food, they want to have you know, closer communities, this sort of, I, I am the best, I have to have everything uh, generation seems to be com coming of age and the younger generation thinks differently. I think that's very exciting. Um, and if you look across the world, there are uh, eco-villages uh, sprouting up all over the place. Um, Solheimer is one of the oldest one in the world, but now they are uh, everywhere. Um, and then the transition town initiatives are also really taking off. That only started in 2005. And in 2015, there are almost 2,000 initiatives across the world on transition towns. Has everybody heard about transition towns? Be basically, uh, they focus on the post-oil era, where we need to live in communities, produce our own food, uh, and, 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 you know, live a, a more local collaborative lifestyles. And, oh, I just talked about this. And I'd like to bring this woman into the room because um, she has had, she just passed away on Sunday, uh, Hilter Jackson. She is the co-founder of Gaia Trust and Gaia Trust has for, since the 80s, supported um, the building up of eco-villages and um, she was imperative in designing the eco-village design um, curriculum which you, you can now go to an eco-village and learn how to live in an eco-village and learn how to build an eco-village. Um, beautiful woman. And, and the eco-village uh, community has built uh, this Gaia wheel they call uh, where we focus on worldview, which would be the well-being of citizen I talked about earlier, the, the nature or the ecological, the economy and the society. And if you go on a course on eco-village design education, then you go through all these modules. You, you learn about green buildings and, and whole systems approaches and local economies and... and, and uh, art and the importance of rituals and so on. So basically, you, you learn from the people who have already been developing these villages for, for uh, several decades. Okay. And very central to food growing in eco-villages and transition towns is permaculture. Now, how, how much have you... How much do you know about permaculture? Huh? Yeah. Permaculture? One person? Two people, three people, four people, okay, four people, okay, so maybe, maybe a third or a half. Permaculture is something I first heard about when I lived in Bristol in England, and I started holding meetings at, uh, on how would Bristol look um, if it were sustainable with the, with the people of Bristol. And up popped, when we were summarizing the results, like concepts like, edible streets and edible gardens and community gardens and, and, and I was thinking, where do these concepts come from? Well, they come from permaculture because 
basically um, it's a, a permaculture stands for um, a permanent agriculture uh, and culture is, 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 a, is a, a very good part of it. And it, it was Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, his student, who developed the concept of learning from ecosystems um, and then cu cultivate forest gardens where you have many layers, so it looks sort of like an ecosystem out in the forest where you grow your own food, where everything in the, in the, in the garden should be edible. There is a, there's a guy in, who has just come to, to Iceland, actually, um, who lives in Norway, and he has over 2,000 edible plants in his garden. And he gave a talk, he gave a course in Iceland last week, I mean, and um, based on his book, Around the World in 80 Plants. Uh, yeah, Stephen Barstow. He's not Norwegian, I think he's American or British. I think he's British. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I've, I've just seen photographs of his, his garden and it looks fantastic. I want a garden like this. Okay, and also within permaculture we have um, the system of, of, of ponds and plants, having floating rafts with plants that, that are nourished by the water in the plant, and the water in the, and the pond and, and the nourishment comes from the fish. So this is where aquaponics comes into permaculture. And they often have um, ducks, and this is exactly what the Chinese did also. They had, they had these systems. Uh, the Aztecs had also islands um, that they built in, in lakes uh, doing similar things. So I actually find, I, I finally took a permaculture design course uh, two years ago in Norway and with Jan Bang. Do you know him? And, uh, and then I brought Jan Bank to Iceland last year to give a course, and, and that was a lot of fun. So basically, the um, permaculture has three major ethics, which I think we can use everywhere. You know, this, this is the ethics I like to have in my life. It's care for the earth, care for people, and share the proceeds. But this is all about uh, building a habitable planet with... Uh, people that feel well and, and, and make sure that the, the distribution of wealth is, is, uh, is not uneven. And then there are also 12 uh, design principles that, that David Holmgren added uh, to the initial ideology. And I think um, aquaponics people could learn a lot from that because it's all about being slow and observing and take time to figure out how things work. So uh, basically first before you do anything then start observing. Uh, then make sure you catch and store the energy. Then make sure you get some yield, that is you, you get something you can actually eat. Um, apply self-regulation and accept feedback, you know, understand that this is all a system. Uh, use and value renewable resources and services, so make sure that you recycle everything. Uh, produce no waste. Uh, design from patterns to detail, so look at the big picture first, then go to the detail. Integrate rather than segregate, so that's what aquaponics is all about, integrating. Use small and slow solutions, you know, start small. Uh, Use the value of diversity. It's, 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 uh, ecosystems are incredibly rich, and they, the uh, most richest ecosystems are the ones that are more, are more stable. But this is something that agriculture could think about also, is, is not only to have one type of plant and one fish, but to integrate. Use edges uh, and value the marginal. You know, where edges come together, different plants and so on, that's often where the uh, very important interaction take place. Uh, creative, uh, creati creatively use respond to change. You know, don't be a, uh, afraid of change. You know, but follow through what you can learn from it. And uh, and that so those are the principles that I think uh, you could all use. So if you're 
are stuck in designing your aquaponic system, take some time to step back and learn a little bit about permaculture. I have some books here if you want to have a look at them. And you can find, you know, a lot of people have put together, you know, why permaculture and, and they show how society and the economy and the environment interact and what you can achieve by that. And then there is this whole a so-called permaculture flower, if you go on a permaculture course, then you learn about green buildings, uh, tools and technology, education and culture, uh, health and spiritual well-being, uh, finance and economics, so focus on the local, land tenure and community governance, um, uh, and land and nature stewardship. So you learn how all of this interacts. Um, all by usually not in very much detail, but enough for you to, to start to think about the interaction. And there are all sorts of permaculture flowers on the, on the web if you look. And, and then this is applied to, to, to uh, farms or gardens where um, zones are set up, where if it's a farm, then in zone one you have the food you eat every day, and in zone two you have uh, uh, your animal housing and, and, and zone three, uh, you have, you know, your apple orchard and so on. Um, and then zone five is, is, the, is the forest around. Uh, or you could do it in your garden and make it, or on your balcony. You know, there are people have learned to, to use the permaculture principles in very small places. And in Cuba, which went through peak oil in the early 1990s, when they stopped getting subsidies and oil and fertilizer from Russia, when Russia collapsed, or Soviet Union collapsed, they uh, almost starved to death. But the, uh, Bill Mollison and other permaculturists went to Cuba, taught them how to uh, grow their own food on their balconies, on their roofs, on their parking lots, and so on. And, and, and the gardens usually look very interesting, you know, they like to make it easy and simple and keyhole beds um, so that you can reach the plants all the way to the middle um, and so on. And, and this, I find a, a, a very interesting um, example. There was a student at the University of uh, Massachusetts in Amherst who was uh, concerned about the lack of sustainability thinking in his university, and he managed to get the university to hire him as their environmental officer, and then he applied permaculture to change the campus. So he took all the green lawns that were all over, as they have in these campus, um, campus universities, and year by year he changes the lawns with the help of students and staff um, and the canteen, uh, into edible gardens. So now the students can walk through here, can sit here and enjoy. They can pick some herbs you know, or vegetables to take if they are cooking themselves and the kitchen goes out and gets the vegetables and so on. So from totally useless uh, green lawns to um, an edible garden, um, I think is a brilliant, brilliant idea. Okay, so I'd like to end up with talking about the Sustainable Development Goals and tell you how I got involved in, with thinking about in, them. And that was, I got an email in 2012 inviting me to come to New York to discuss the new development goals of the United Nations. And I thought, oh, I've never done any development work. Why am I being in, in, invited? And, and then the signature on the letter was the King of Bhutan. And I thought this must be spam and I always, almost hit delete. But then I started looking at the other people who were being invited and I started recognizing some of my colleagues around the world who were all sustainability experts. And I thought, aha, that's how I ended up on this list. So I went to New York in 2012 along with 900 other people who all came there at their own cost to discuss with the Prime Minister of Bhutan how we can change the development goals um, to include <coughs> sustainable development. And in Bhutan, the measure was called the gross national happiness, but not GDP. Because the king says that it's 
um, the role of, um, um, of, of an emperor should be the happiness and well-being of his people, not GDP. And so he, um, he said this to a journalist at some point at an airport, and, and then he decided that he needed to then stand behind these words and, and start to measure um, the gross national happiness. And so a, a lot of people I know were invited to Bhutan to help develop this gross national happiness um, indicator, and it, it's based on a survey, so people are asked about their, their education level and the time they have for contemplation, which is very important in Bhutan. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the way of life and whether they have good relationship with their neighbors and so on. So all, all this is then aggregated into one indicator. And then when they look at the different regions of Bhutan, if, if but the regions that have a lower in, uh, uh, value of this indicator, they concentrate their efforts there to, to help improve the societal conditions. And, and then, um, so we, we, we gave our advice, but then there were new elections, a new prime minister, and he wasn't uh, that interested in um, GNH or put that outside of Bhutan. He said this was just for Bhutan and, and he didn't want to, to uh, spend uh, Bhutanese energy of getting this into development. But so we, we did write a report though for, for the um, new development paradigm uh, office of Bhutan, which uh, made, their way, made its way to, this, to the UN. Um, but um, probably what we got in there was a focus on inequality, which is, comes very strongly into the vision we have for the future that we need to um, reduce inequality. Um, and also there is something about well-being of people. So with the people that I was there, we formulated the Alliance for Sustainability and Prosperity to focus people's on uh, mind on new indicators, which we call beyond GDP. And we have written, uh, this is a commentary in Nature, and this was in the Geoscientist in Britain um, last year. And, and at the basis of that is that we need to think about the live support system and keep that going. Um, and in that we have a quantifiable uh, nature capital, and we we, we need to build, build that and support that. And within that, we then have society uh, and the economy. And this is the framework we came up with in, in Bhutan, was that, uh, and this is in the language of ecological economics, because in, in, my, in my group, led by Bob Costanza, who is an ecological economist, um, there's a lot of thinking along those ways. That, that is that in, in our world, we have, different types of capital, natural, built, human, and social, uh, and in, including in that is financial capital. And we need to balance that uh, to develop a new development paradigm uh, with ecological sustainability and fair distribution of wealth and regenerative economy uh, and living democracy. That is, we have an economy that supports um, nature. And uh, on that, we can build uh, hu basic human needs um, and we can develop subjective well-being even by, by teaching happiness skills, if, if that is necessary. And the ultimate goal is sustainable, prosperous and equitable well-being for humans and the rest of nature. So if we do, uh, nature is not sustainable, then we cannot be sustainable. And all of this needs to be within the planetary boundaries. So this is our ultimate framework. Now, last summer, the, uh, after intensive consultations with governments and NGOs and businesses around the world, these 17 development goals uh, came out. Um, so, and poverty and hunger, uh, healthy lives, uh, inclusive and equitable uh, qu quality education, uh, gender equality, uh, sustainable management of water and sanitation, um, modern energy for all, 
um, economic growth, they're still there, unfortunately, but employment is here also and decent work for everybody. Uh, build resilient infrastructure, uh, reduce inequality within and among countries, make cities and human settlements inclusive and safe, um, sustainable consumption, um, uh, combat climate change, um, conserve sustainable use of the oceans, so there's a focus on the oceans for the first time, protect, restore and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, so this is the, the ecological framework, promote peaceful and inclusive societies, and strengthen the means of implementation um, of the sustainable development goals. So this is the first time that the development goals of the United Nations include anything about nature and the stability of nature. And so in, in that respect, this is an incredible achievement. And, but now, uh, if this is agreed at the end of this month, we need to figure out how we're going to achieve all of this. And most people don't have a clue. So what we have been thinking about is what are these goals about? Um, they are about uh, natural capital. So these are four goals that, that address that. Then there is social capital. And there are two, four, six, eight goals that, that uh, address that. And then um, uh, net, uh, economic contribution. And there are five goals that address that. But how do we know? Well, if we achieve one goal, will that then impede the, the achievement of another? And this is something that is not terribly well understood and, and we need to um, address. So in a meeting we had together um, in South Africa uh, this summer, we did, developed the idea of how does a society look like that uh, is is on the track of and, and is determined to achieve the sustainable development goals. And we called it the Republic of Well-Being or the Gelato Society because we thought we, we need to make it fun so people, you know, think about it. Uh, so we thought about this uh, ice cream cone that would be the ecological life support system that we need. And then uh, balanced on that, we need to, uh, to have the society uh, and the economy. And uh, in an article that we published in The Guardian last week, we described this society. Um, and, and basically, the aim of the uh, Gelato Society would be to, to regenerate nature, that business shows environmental uh, responsibility. We would have a regenerative economy that focuses on what's good for people and nature. We would have inequality reporting. That has already started in France. Uh, we would have, uh, we would be active at the international stage to focus, you know, focus other na um, nations on the sustainable development goals. We would have integrated governance so that the economic and the environmental factors would work, to, uh, ministries, for example, would work together. We would map out the environmental and economic, um, um, uh, economic consequences of electoral programs. We ha would have sustainability in the constitution. I think that's in incredibly important. Uh, we would give nature human rights. At the moment, the uh, only entities that have rights in front of courts are people and corporations. Nature has no rights. And this is something I think is very important to achieve. Uh, they would focus on the SDGs. As I said, we would have li uh, living democracy, that this, the people in the country would be very uh, active in reminding governments of what their aims were, and how, you know, that the, in the, the country would have uh, extensive and effective consultations. And we would focus on ecosystem and human well-being. Would you like to live in the Gelato Society? <laughs> so this is what, 
So because, you know, the goals are so complex, I actually hired a student this summer to map them out in a systemic manner uh, with, with Harald, uh, my, my husband and, and collaborator. And we basically mapped out the world system and then thought, so the, here we have energy and resources and here we have the infrastructure of society and here we have the societal system and, and here we have equality and, and the social trust and so on. Um, and what we found out is that there is no focus on resources. So it, none of the goals talk about resources. Uh, and there is no focus on uh, corruption or social trust. So and now we have analyzed these further with the 169 targets and so on. So this will be a master's thesis for next year. So do you think aquaponics can help um, reaching any of these goals? So I'm going to put the goals up again, and then you tell me which goals aquaponics could address. So you see, now you have mentioned one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine out of 17 goals. But you see that what you are doing can help with the circular economy and the sustainable development goals. So once there is a consultation in your town or in, in, in your nation about how the hell are we going to you know, achieve the sustainable development goals, I, I know that the, one of the permaculture person an eco, from an eco village in Scotland, she rushed out of the meeting yesterday to go to Scotland and talk to the the Scottish Parliament of how to achieve the sustainable development goals in Scotland. So these consultations are starting. So uh, you guys can play a part to achieve these very important goals. Okay. All right. Um, I think we, we need to end this, but at the end I'd like to tell you about 12 PhD studentships that are being advertised now on developing e new economic systems. <coughs> and it's at the University of Iceland and clermont ferrand in France and U University of Stockholm. So if you're interested, then come and talk to me. They're fully funded by the European Union. So in conclusion, uh, so natural resources are dwindling and we need to focus on recycling. And resources form, form the basis of the, econ uh, of the economy. Um, aquaponics fits into the circular economy. Um, and permaculture can give aquaponics guidance. It actually arises from permaculture, as you pointed out. Uh, and aquaponics touches uh, several of the S SDGs. So, uh, I think um, what you are doing is going to help us um, live on this one planet we have, which is floating like a spaceship out there. Um, and we only get energy from the sun, otherwise this is a closed system. And we are trapping some of the energy that uh, is, it should be reflected back into space in the atmosphere, because this, this thin blue line here is, is the atmosphere. And that's why we have uh, climate change. And we need to learn to live on this one planet of ours. And the faster we change our ways, the better. So, thank you very much.